can be subject to noise, right? And then uh, it's important to, you know, to be able to, to distinguish clearly what is the herd, the core of the signal, and what is just uh, noise, surrounding noise, right? The same Kalman was also the one who somehow continued in the, the spirit of what Kochi did in the context of ordinary differential equations. Kalman said, listen, rather than considering each problem differently with different notations, why don't we unify things a little bit, right? And he said, let's write, let's write the system as being x prime equal to ax. In principle, a is a matrix, but of course you could move into a nonlinear setting where a is a nonlinear operator. A could be also a partial differential operator, could be uh, a Laplacian, and then this will be like a, a diffusion process, a heat process or a wave process, transport of, of gas, electricity, of water, or networks. It could also be a, a, a you know, a social network like uh, internet, right? So where, you know, the dimension of this vector X in our N, right? N is the dimension of the vector is huge, right? If we put together all the in nodes in internet, this will be a huge graph, right? But finite after all, which is somehow interconnected through this, say, interaction graph matrix A, right? So this is a very general presentation, right? It could also allow to handle uh, collective dynamics, you know, individuals in motion in the street, interacting each other, okay? So this is the kind of general model that uh, Kalman adopted. And he said, the difference between Cauchy and Kalman is not only that Cauchy was with a C and Kalman is with, with a K, right? So what Cauchy was doing for Cauchy, there was not control, right? For Cauchy, it was simply, you give me this kind of time evolution problem, in which you are looking for a trajectory X depending on time so that at every time this gives you a point XT in some uh, given ambient space, uh, Rn in this case, but it could also be a functional space. So for Cauchy, the goal was given an initial datum in that space, find a unique trajectory solving this equation. When you are in the context of control, right? For Kalman, things are even a bit more complicated because then you say, well, but now the system is not uh, simply evolving spontaneously, right? You are acting on it the same way you drive your bicycle or your car, right? You are acting on it and your actions, you know, are entering on the system through a new vector U, which uh, will have a number of components M, right? M, of course, in practice is normally much less, right? So, no, uh, you, 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 you watch a soccer uh, match, I don't know, stadium, uh, Bilbao Stadium, Atleti de Bilbao. I think uh, uh, 50,000 people uh, can enter the San Mamese Stadium, 50,000, mm -hmm. okay? And of course, there will be a lot of security and a lot of police there in order to avoid that anything happens. And if something happens, all the emergencies are handled in a, in a safe manner. But there are what? There are maybe 100 policemen there to control 50,000 people, right? So you see that very often in practice, you know, a system describing a state with many, many components, X1, X2, up to Xn, where n can be very large, 50,000, you can aim to control it with a vector u, which is, you know, also taking components u1, u2, up to um, but m having much less components. Now, how this is done? Well, of course, in order to complete this model, you need a, an operator b. The operator b is the way each of these controls, right? There are M of them is distributed along the network. How much is each control influencing the system, right? And, and then these matrices A and B are those that are completely defining the control system. So what is control? Well, control is something very natural. 
Now you have an initial datum as in the Cochi problem, but now you have also a target, right? So you are now in office. So it's uh, 9 30 a.m. in Brazil, you are in office, but you know, in the evening, you have to go back home. It's like uh, 7 p.m. Okay. So at a given time, you will start operating and then you will adopt a control strategy, which is walking to the street, taking the metro, the bus, or the bike, and then driving and so on to get to destination. There is a destination. There is a, a final time, capital T, at which you want to land wherever you are supposed to be. And then there is a final destination. And then the question that, uh, that uh, Kalman considered is, everyone understands, is that of controllability. So is it true that the system AB, actually, we can talk about a system AB, you can write it down in details, right? So the system AB will be X prime equal AX plus BU. But in fact, if you give me A and you give me B, I now immediately understand what the system AB is. I look to the matrix A, I see a matrix, a square matrix, N times N, and then I immediately understand that I am dealing with a dynamical system with N components. And you see a matrix B that has, uh, you know, N, n rows but only m columns and then you immediately realize that there will be only m controls for n components of the system okay so you can talk about the system a b and then what Kalman said is listen uh, you know this system is controllable if and only if the rank of the super matrix B, A, B up to A, N minus one B is equal to N. So this is a, a, a beautiful result, right? In the sense that it is just a, in principle, a very simple linear algebra characterization that everyone understands, right? And, and just to make things precise, so recall that the matrix A is a matrix N times N. The matrix B is a matrix N times M with M typically much less than N. Recall that N is the number of uh, visitors in the, in, the, in the museum or in the stadium, and M is, is the number of people in take, uh, taking care of the, of the security of the, of the installation, right? So you see that this is a matrix N times N. Now, A, B is what? You multiply the matrix A, N times N, with another matrix B N times M, and then you get another matrix N times M. So eventually when you put all them together, what you had is a matrix N times N times M. So I realized that maybe the, the terminology N and M is not the best. So maybe next time I should call P the, the M, and then it will be easier to distinguish N and P, okay? But in any case, so N, N as in Niteroi, and then M as in Manaus, okay? Good. So you see in particular that when M is equal to one, so if you are really so ambitious that you believe that just by one single control, right? There is one single control that is able to control all the end components of the system. If you aim this, then according to Kalman, what you have to succeed is that the range of this matrix is full. Of course, this is in general true, but when M is greater, you have many more chances. Why? Because when M is equal to one, this is a matrix N times N. So you compute its rank. If the rank is full, it's fine. If the rank is not full, there is nothing you can do. However, when you have M equal two, right? The matrix now, the Kalman matrix is of dimension n times 2n. And then, of course, there are many, many sub matrices of size n times n, which are embedded into this one and that give you the chance of having the range rank n. And this is in agreement with our intuition, right? That the more controls you use, the easier should be to control a system, right? Now, what Kalman said, listen, all this is totally characterized by this algebraic condition. When the rank of this matrix is N, 
this is done, you can guarantee the system is controllable. And if the rank is less, then the system is not controllable. So a typical example is the, is the Nelson car. Uh, this is uh, described in this uh, uh, nice book of uh, Eduardo Sontag, uh, now 24 years old, right? So it's, I think is freely downloadable by, from his webpage. Uh, and then here he talks about the Nelson car. I don't know whether Nelson was a mathematician or this was a brand of car or why, why you know, he was calling it uh, Nelson. But in any case, we all understand this model. This, is a, this leads to a very interesting simple model in mechanics, right? Where you say, okay, this is a very simple car. Uh, we take a car as being a rectangle on the plane. Uh, how many parameters I need to determine the position of a car on the plane. Well, I need uh, two parameters for the center of gravity, say, one parameter for the, you know, for the angle of the main axis of the car, and one extra parameter for the angle of the wheels, right, in uh, comparison with the main axis of the car. So you are in 4D. So n is equal to four. This is a dynamical system in dimension four. And the number of controls are just acceleration, back and forth, and gear, right? Left and right. And then in that book, you see, well, the, the model that is derived is nonlinear. So you have to develop a bit further the idea of Kalman. And then you can do it in two stages. Either you linearize using the inverse function theorem and you apply the Kalman rank condition, or you go a bit further using. Lee brackets, right? But in any case, you can check that, you know, this system is controllable. So this is a typical example in which M equal to, right? So M equal to, M equal to, and N equal four, and you can control the system. So our maybe initial intuition that the system can be controlled with few controls is confirmed here, right? On the other hand, this also shows you that it's not like in, in linear systems resolution that you need as many equations as variables. No, here you can have much less controls than, than uh, components on the state, but the system is controllable. Now, but now you could tell me, well, but you see, uh, you know, you say that the system is controllable, Enrique, because you are uh, happy by traveling on the plane. But you see, we live in a three-dimensional uniform, right? And I would like, you know, the system to be also controllable, not only in R2, in R3. I will tell you, well, it's the same model, right? So it's just that, you see, uh, in order to determine the center of gravity of the car, now you have to add one more variable because the car can be, you know, sitting in you know at any height so then you will tell me oh but then the dimension of the system is not four is five and if you compute the Kalman rank right you will see that is four so you are in one of those situations where the Kalman rank condition is not fulfilled why because you take your control system ab you do all the this business of computing the brackets carefully and when you compute the brackets, you see, oh, unfortunately, I didn't get n. I got n minus 1. Well, then this result by Kalman tells you also what's going on. In case instead of getting n, you get n minus 1, what you can guarantee is that all by one components of the system is controllable. But one component of the system is out of control. And this is precisely what happens in this Nelson car, if you think on the car as being embedded in a space. You can control the car, you can move freely along the plane, you can orient the car as you wish, you can bring it to the any destination you wish, but please don't ask me, you know, to also regulate the height of the car because this is reserved to helicopters. Cars, automobiles cannot do that. Okay, good. So uh, back in uh, 88, uh, you know, I mentioned 
you know, control theory, cybernetics, uh, optimization theory. Of course, optimization and control are uh, hard to distinguish oftentimes. You know, the kind of problems are uh, similar. Calculus of variation, optimization, control, you know, are often very correlated, right? Actually, one of the most fundamental results in control theory, the Pontryagin maximum principle, the maximum principle of Pontryagin has nothing to do with what is known uh, as the maximum principle for elliptic equations, for instance, where we are thinking on the comparison principle, right? So that solutions are monotonic somehow on parameters, right? In the, in the context of control, the Pontryagin maximum principle is a principle of optimality, is the generalization of the classical con uh, concept of uh, Lagrange multipliers, right? to control problems, right? So, and this is what you see even in Hollywood movies, you see the challenge of, uh, you know, uh, sending a rocket from earth to the moon. And then you have to, I mean, this is a very complicated ballistic problem, right? Where you have to really make computations very, very precisely to make sure that, you know, the, the, the engine, right? The, the rocket, right? The satellite will really go from earth to the moon. And then even more importantly, that we'll be able, you will be able to bring back, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, tripulated uh, engine back from the moon to earth, right? And then you see these complicated computations. Uh, I think the film was hidden figures, right? So you see women computing in, in huge blackboards, right? Uh, one of the critical computation being, right? at what time, in which position, you know, the rocket has to enter the atmosphere so that when finally it lands in, on Earth, actually on the, on the ocean, right, is more or less in an area in which you know that there will be boats ready to rescue, you know, the, you know, the, the tripulation, the, the, you know, the astronauts, right, before, you know, this, this satellite, this rocket, uh, you know, uh, sinks uh, in in the in the deep ocean, right? And and then you see uh, this optimality computation, right? Is precisely the one you can uh, you know perform using the the Pontryagin maximum principle that in the you know in the uh, Soviet Union was precisely developed in order to face the challenges of astronautics, the same way as other uh, methods in control and optimization were also developed in order to face uh, challenges like, uh, you know, for instance, in, in economy or industrial development, right? So one of the, uh, another example is Monche Kantorovich, right? So the French mathematician Monche introduced the problem of optimal transport that was then later further developed and translated and generalized in the context of economics by Kantorovich, mathematician doing optimization theory, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in the, in the old uh, Soviet Union, okay? Another very relevant uh, seminal contribution was due to Jacques Lyons in France. So it was back in 88 that uh, Jacques Lyons got the the John von Neumann Prize of the SIAM, the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, right? Uh, and in that paper, I mean, he wrote a survey article at that occasion in the SIAM Review. It's a very nice paper to read. There is actually another one by David Russell that was published in the, in the same journal just 10 years back. So these, these two references, keep them in mind. Very nice articles, long, but very well written, very pedagogic worth to read, right? In which uh, Leon said, listen, uh, according to the duality theory, we know that every convex function has a, you know, a convex conjugate. We know that every optimization problem has a, also a dual uh, optimization problem according to, you know, Fenchel, uh, Rockefeller um, uh, duality principle. He looked to the problem of the dual problem of control, right? And this is where he discovered a, a very uh, natural, but uh, until then not uh, clearly 
uh, understood and described a structure that then paved the way to handle many other problems, in particular in the context of the control of partial differential equations. So the model, the models of, of mechanics. So uh, heat equation, diffusion processes, right? Diffusion as diffusion for heat, but also diffusion for diffusion in population dynamics in math biology, waves, uh, wave equations, but not only for flexible uh, strings, also acoustic waves, also electromagnetic waves, also uh, um, seismic waves, right? Or even in quantum mechanics, as Rodinger equations, where you encounter you know, wave equations with infinite velocity of propagation. You could also mention many other models that are celebrated, fluid mechanics, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, Corteved debris equation for solitons, and so on, that can be covered by, by the same uh, basic principle, right? What Leon said was, listen, the control problem is a bit complicated because you have the state X and you have the control U. Now, if you look to the adjoint problem, and then the adjoint of a given PDE is just this, uh, say, algebra differential adjoint, right? So the adjoint in the context of the distribution theory is just obtained uh, integrating by parts. So the adjoint of the time derivative is just minus the time derivative, right? And the adjoint of the operator A is just the adjoint of the matrix A or the operator A in case it is really an, an operator, right? And then he said, listen, you take this ad adjoint uh, evolution model. Of course, for the adjoint model, the sense of evolution in time has to be also reversed, right? So this is really not a physical object. This is like the Lagrange multiplier in the context of, uh, say, uh, the minimization of functionals uh, under constraints, right? You, re you remember this was a, a bit a bit a surprise, right? When, as a students, we were used to say maxima and minima are the points where the gradient of the function to be minimized is equal to zero. And then the professor came, okay, but be careful. In case you are minimizing under constraints, you have to introduce Lagrange multiplier lambda, and then the criticality condition is the gradient of F equal to lambda gradient of G. Eventually, you were not interested on the multiplier lambda, but you needed to go through the multiplier lambda in order to discover what, what were the potential critical points of the function J under the constraint given by G. So here is the same, the adjoint is not our goal. Our goal was regulating, say, for instance, temperature X using you know, the, 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 the thermostat U, right? While here, now, or the heating device U. So here, this is just a dual parameter, then this an adjoint object. From the perspective of differential or partial differential equations, the model is well posed. And then what, you know, what Leon said, listen, there is a condition which is completely equivalent to Kalman, and the condition simply reads whether out of measurements B star done on the adjoint, so here it should be written P, not phi, on the adjoint, B star, B star P determines fully P. And of course, in order to determine P, the only thing you need to determine what is the starting point at time capital T. Now, let's, let's check dimensions again. You see, X was a vector, X1, Xn in our N. The adjoint vector has the same dimension. It's also a vector in Rn. You recall the matrix B, was a matrix n times n, n times m. And then the matrix B star is a matrix m times n. So the product of B star with P is a matrix, again, 
of components, what? You multiply, right? Uh, M times N with uh, N times one. Oh, you realize, right? That this is just a scalar number, right? Sorry, this is a vector in Rm. So what you are saying here is that out of a state that is very, 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 very complicated with n components, over here in B star P, I'm just observing n linear combinations of them. These are precisely the sensors. So you recall, cybernetics, according to Wiener, is the science of communication and control in animals and machines. Communications, sensors, information, this is what B star P is about. There is a system which is very complicated with N components, N being very huge, but you only have M linear combinations of the state. Can you determine, can you determine out of the M combinations given by B star, can you determine fully the state? What Leon said, if you are able to solve this problem, then you have also the Kalman rank condition. And actually, if you do a little bit of, say, uh, analysis here, you will easily get to the conclusion that indeed both are equivalent. And the reason why they are equivalent is because, in particular, right, when you are uh, in this context of Kalman, right, the fact that the rank of this matrix is full is equivalent to say that the kernel of the adjoint matrix, which is B star, right? B star, A star, up to B star, A star to the power N minus one is equal to zero, right? So the fact that the rank of the matrix B, A, B and so on is full is equivalent to the kernel of B star, B star, A star and so on to be zero. And this is where you see this uh, result by Lyons playing a role, a role, why? Because after all, what is B star P? Well, B star P is B star applied to the solution of this problem, but the solution of this problem is simply E T minus T A star applied to the datum P T. Now, when this is zero, what happens? Well, when this is zero, you can expand the exponential on a power series expansion, and then you will see emerging precisely out of this, say, uh, power series expansion of the exponential, right? Out of this power series expansion of the exponential, B star exponential A star T minus T applied to PT, you will see emerging terms like B star PT, when you just take the value at T equal capital T, you take the first derivative with respect to T, and then you will see emerging B star A star PT, because when you take a time derivative here, the A star will come out of the exponential, and so on. And, and you see why, and this is an important point that I didn't mention, why in the Kalman rank condition I can stop at the power n minus one. Why shouldn't I consider or keep going and take more and more powers? Well, what Kalman said, listen, if you want, you can take here an infinite matrix and then you will be doing computations forever, right? You will compute the, you can compute also the, the rank of B, A, B up to any power of A and then continue, right? So. Uh, and very large, you can continue up to infinity. But what Kalman observed is that at a given time, and this time is n minus one, this doesn't help anymore. Why? Because according to the classical result of Kyle Hamilton, any matrix A is a zero of the corresponding characteristic polynomial, which means that a power of A, of power n, is always a combination of A0 times the identity, A1 times one, A up to A n minus one times power n minus one of A. Then after power n minus one, you are not adding anything. Okay, so uh, 
by now, please keep in mind control, cybernetics, machine learning are very linked. You can handle control problems in a straightforward manner using the theory of Kalman, in particular, this Kalman rank condition, right? Or you can do it by duality. And then, as Leon's observed, duality is not nice simply because it gives you, you know, a different mathematical characterization in terms of this inequality, which says whether out of a few components, a few sensors placed on a large, very complex system, you can fully recover the information. But because of the controls characterized by this duality principle of Fenchel Rockefeller are given as minimizers of this quadratic functional defined on the adjoint states, you also have a computational algorithm to compute the controls. Why? Because according to Leon's characterization, the control is simply u equal b star p hat. So you ask me for the control, I will tell you, OK, u is b star p hat. What is b star? The adjoint of b. b is given, b star, in, I know. What is p hat? Oh, p hat is more complicated. It's a solution of this adjoint system. But then I will tell you, no problem. We have all the numerical analysis of differential equations and partial differential equations that we can use to compute any solution of this problem. So I can also compute p hat. But you need to give me pt. I can only solve the ODE or the PDE if you give me the initial datum. At this time, t equal capital T, final datum, because this is the adjoint problem evolving backwards in time. How do I determine pt and what Leon said? PT is the minimizer of this functional, where X0 is the initial datum that is to be driven, right, in this particular case. Otherwise, you just will add a further ingredient where the target at time capital T is to bring the system to zero. And now, why this functional has a minimizer? Well, very simple. It's because it's continuous, it's convex, in a Hilbert space, in this case, Rn, and is coercive. Why is coercive? Is coercive because this observability inequality, the communication part that Norbert Wiener was referring to, is fulfilled. And this is fulfilled simply because the B matrix has been chosen strategically, right? So, in particular, when you are monitoring a large network where something is flowing, information or, or gold, doesn't really matter, something is flowing in this network, you have to guarantee that the sensors are placed on those points in which the information, you know, will be channeled, will be observed while, you know, the dynamics on goals, right? And therefore, this led to another fundamental contribution, which was not only we understand the control of systems independent of what their complexity is, even if they are in the PD setting where they are genuinely uh, infinite dimensional problems, but we can also provide computational methods to systematically handle them and compute numerical approximations of controls simply because we are in the nice context of the calculus of variations where you can apply gradient descent algorithms, right? Well, all this is true, but as I said, another giant of control theory, Bellman said, be careful because depending on what the dimension of the system is, maybe this effort of computing, applying the gradient descent algorithm, uh, maybe is not so easy, right? Because what is a gradient? A gradient is, you know, a partial derivative on the first variable times, of, I mean, comma, the second partial derivative, comma. If there are too many variables in the, in the space, even if this is conceptually easy, it can be computationally very cumbersome. And this is when people said, okay, in case for some reason, the number of variables in your problem is too high and you cannot really end up applying uh, in your computer, the gradient descent, because simply, you know, uh, you, you don't have enough storage capacity or computing capacity, just apply the stochastic gradient descent, which is 
one of the most powerful tools that is also being used in the context of machine learning nowadays. Okay, so this was a brief introduction to control. So tomorrow I will briefly uh, tell you about uh, the concept of Tarpike, right? I, I just uh, mentioned it very briefly what it is, uh, but I did the exercise uh, and it works, right? So today I said, okay, I went to, you know, to Google Maps, right? Uh, yeah. And I said, okay, I wanna go from uh, Florianopolis, you know, in the south of uh, Brazil, right? I wanna go from Florianopolis to Lima, you know, uh, south uh, east here, Florianopolis, right? South of Brazil, you see here, I don't know, a few, what, 1,000 kilometers south of Sao Paulo or even more, uh, south also of Rio de Janeiro, right? Florianopolis to the south of Brazil. In the Atlantic coast, I wanna go to Lima, right? In Peru, uh, in the Pacific coast, right? And then as soon as I ask the road to Google Maps, Google doesn't hesitate. It tells me immediately, right? There is a highway, right? And then they tell me the number of kilometers is 4,543, right? And then in order to drive this, of course, non-stop, right? So no coffee, no sleep, no eating for 61 hours. If you drive, then you get there, okay? And this is more or less symmetric, of course, 61 hours driving from Lima to Florianopolis. Now, why Google told me this? Well, because, you know, there are many other ways you can go, right? I could certainly decide not to take the highway. You say, well, no, the highway, I don't like, there are too many tracks. I take a small paths. Of course, I can still go, right? I can follow certainly a small paths. I go through, I don't know, Iwazu, and then I get to Asuncion, and then, you know, and then I decide to, you know, to cross the, the desert uh, in Chile and so on, and I take a different path. Fine, you can do it but then it will not take you 61 hours. It will take you maybe 200 hours. So as uh, you know, von Neumann anticipated, and this was further developed later, you know, in the pioneering works of uh, Samuelson, also Nobel Prize in economics, they said, listen, when the origin and destination in our control problem are very far, when they are very far, Normally, there is a tar pie. Normally, there is a highway. And the way we understand this highway in mathematics is the way this drawing here is uh, drawn, right? So there is a point of origin. There is a point of destination, right? So point of origin, point of origin here. Right? There is a point of origin. There is a point of destination. And if you want to go from this one to that one in an optimal way, optimal to be determined, it could be minimal time travel or minimal expense and so on, or minimal uh, gasoline consume. It depends. Normally, Google Maps gives you minimal time. Maybe it's not the cheapest because then you have to pay the toll in the highway. Okay, this is why you say, no, 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 I don't use highways. Then uh, the map will give you another solution, right? So normally Google Maps is minimal time. In minimal time, then the Tarpike principle says, according to what you know, von Neumann and Samuel discovered that we interpret in the context of dynamical systems is that to go from this point to this point, there is a Tarpike, you know, there is a transition point in which the best you can do you run to this transition point, you remain there for most of the time, and then you jump, you quit again. Now, in particular, right, this is what happens when you take the train, you get out of office, you run, and then you get into the metro. When you are in the metro, you sit, you wait, no problem. So maybe it's 45 minutes, maybe there are 28 stations, no problem, just uh, take a nap or read something. When you get there, you jump out, and then you run again to get to the destination. This is what we are doing permanently in our daily life. We are 
always acting nearly in a tar pike context. This is something that is already built in in our brain. And this is just a mathematical representation of that fact that is one of the cornerstones in, in control theory that I will further develop tomorrow. And that as you will see the next Friday, it has also important implications in the context of machine learning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Spasio, for this beautiful and enlightening talk. There is any questions or comments in the audience? There's no questions in the chat. So if there is no any questions, let's thank Professor Suasua with this. Thank you, Julio. Beautiful reactions here in the in the Zoom. Now I'm going to stop the recording. And so I tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah, tomorrow at the same time, same channel. Very good. Very good. I I in this day.